Bible says, bless and curse not. Amen. You know the Romans 12, 14, the last thing we're going to face, amen, is having to bless our enemy. That's the truth now. That's the last thing we're going to face. Romans chapter 12, verse 10, says this. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. In verse 14. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Luke chapter 6. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Amen. I understand that. And if I didn't have a degree, I'd understand it. The child out there understands it. You know, you know Jesus, I, I'm telling you, the last test we're going to face is that. That is, that is the last test that Jesus faced on the cross. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. Luke chapter 6, verse 26 through 36. And God is preparing. He's preparing a world now that hates everything that's good and godly. He's got the new world, new world order, just like the Roman government. Amen. The Roman government at his time was a worldwide empire. All power was in his hand. It had the power of life and death. The, the, the very religious power was wrapped up with it too. See, and that's what's coming up. And that's what Jesus faced at the very end. Luke chapter 6, verse 26 through 36. You see, and that is not really our, and that is not what we're warring against, though. Our warfare is not against flesh and blood. Nowhere, no way, nobody, in no circumstance. All we're doing is fighting against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness of this world. And one thing they want to do is to get us not to do the Word of God. That's the whole goal of Satan, is that we would not do God's word. He don't care if you get a, a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars, a new car, new whatever, anything you want, prosper, or any other thing. It doesn't, you know, Satan doesn't care. It makes no difference to him whether you dress nice, you don't dress nice, or any other thing. I'm talking about to him. He's after one thing to get you to disobey the word of God. That's it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, look, 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 there are people that pack with the devil. The, the rock stars, they do it. They make a pack with the devil. Amen, like Michael Jackson, they make a pack with the devil. Hundreds of millions of dollars, multi-millionaires. They got airplanes, rolls, what you name it. The devil doesn't mind one bit. Doesn't bother him at all. He's one, one thing the devil wants us not to do. Do the will of God. Do the word of the Lord. Luke chapter 6, verse 26 through 36. That's, that's the truth. I mean, he don't even care. He don't care if I get up here and preach. Amen. And do anything else. Amen. If I don't do the word of God, that's all right. He don't care if I cast out devils, pray for the sick, speak in tongues. If I don't do the word of God. Amen. Now, those things are contained in the word of God. And I believe in each one of those things. But I'm just like Jesus said, hey, me going to come in that day saying, Lord, Lord, have what you did this and Matt, Matt, and he said, hey, but you didn't do the will of the Father. And as you didn't do the word of God, and that's what counts. Amen. I mean, I'm not just counting the other. I believe in all the other things. You know what I'm saying? I do them things. But I'm just saying, amen. We've got to live by every, every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. Woe, verse 26, Luke 6, 26. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. But I say unto you which here love your enemies. Oh, man. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. It doesn't say take up arms and shoot them. Amen. It says they smite you on the one, just give them the other cheek. Amen. It doesn't say get an M16 or an AK-47. It says get another cheek. Give them another cheek. Let's give them a good smile. Lord bless you. And just pull out the other cheek for him. And let him take it. That's what he said. Yeah. And uh, him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. And if he wants to take your house, let him take it. If he wants to take your land, let him have it. I mean, th this man was down to his cloak. 
Do you understand what Jesus was saying? Jesus was saying, hey, this wasn't a person that had, you know what I'm saying? This man was down to his coat, the thing he needed maybe to keep warm at night, and he said, let him even take that. Now, don't withhold anything. Just give him what they want. Amen. And he goes on down the line. And there's a reason. He says, give to every man that asketh of thee, and to him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. That's a good rule. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and the reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. The Lord is kind. In other words, you can't even determine whether you're good or evil by God's kindness to you. In fact, I got a message on that. No, just because God is kind to you and is nice to you and is prospering you and blessed or any other thing, that doesn't mean he considers you either good or evil. You don't know whether he considers you good or evil by his kindness. That's the truth. Most people say, oh, look, God's being kind to me. The Lord must be pleased with me. No, sir. That's a grave error. See, that Bible right there tells you it's a grave error. It's a grave error, and I'm going to get us that, but not tonight. Romans chapter 3. It is. It's a grave error. There's only one way you know if you're right, if you're doing the will of God. That's it. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. I remember years ago, the, the Lord showed me something about that. And I know it, it sounds crazy, but it, that's the only way. He that turneth his way, ear. From hearing the law, even his prayer shall become sin. You can't do that. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, And is it written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. For they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, with their tongues they have used to see. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. James chapter 3. I want to read some scriptures. The Bible says, bless and curse not. Now I want to show you where cursing comes from. Because I guarantee you, the final battle we're, we're facing, the final one now, is what I'm going to tell you about tonight. Satan's after your soul. I say he don't care what you do as far as is this world good or any other thing. He's after one thing. He's after your soul. Amen. James chapter 3. Thank God we got an advocate. You know. No man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. I believe that with all my heart. But I believe no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. But we can turn loose. That's the only, that's the only thing. We must cleave unto the Lord with purpose of heart. With a purpose of heart, we must cleave unto the Lord. James chapter 3, verses 1, one through 5, I want to start with. I just want to read a few scriptures here. Amen. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships which, though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor this. Verse, verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindle. I'm going to go on to verse 6. Now remember that. Now we said, behold, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Now I'm going to show you an order tonight. 
I want to show you an order tonight. I'm going to show you scriptural order. I'm going to show you from the Word of God. I'm going to show you examples in the Word of God how something happens in the spiritual realm. And I want you to see it. Remember that word boasting. Verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. It's set on fire of hell. Now, he's going to tell you what he's talking about now. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things are not so to be. You know, you, and I'm going to get to more scripture. You wonder what in the world was going on in the early church. It's amazing how many apostles now dealt with this thing right here. That's right. They dealt with blessing and cursing and bitterness. Because I want to tell you, bitterness breeds cursing. And bitterness is one of the most destructive things to ever touch the face of the earth. It's one of the most deadly, defiling spiritual things to ever touch. And we're in the last days. And the Bible says, perilous, dangerous spiritual times can come. And therefore, this here is going to be a major spiritual enemy we've got to wrestle against. Amen. It's going to be a major. And then he goes on to say, Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy, see now he's talking about it. He's telling what is there. He's telling what happens. He's saying what is there. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly central and devilish. I want you to turn me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, I've heard in the world and many times I've seen, he's saying that wisdom, it'll stop people. You can stop people with your tongue now. You can shut people down with your tongue. I've seen it a lot of times. I've seen it in work in different areas. Somebody just stop them with their tongue. Amen. But, but it's a worldly type of wisdom. Amen. I've seen them factory. Uh, they, they boast about it. Boy, I shut them down. They be jiving, two of them jiving, cutting up. And then the other one just lays some kind of, uh, of, of evil cursing on the other one that is so filthy and so disgusting and so shameful that the other one is so shamed that they won't even say anything else. And then the other one will boast. See, this is the worldly wisdom. And everybody in the factory or wherever work will say, yeah, hey, he shut them down, didn't he? Y'all never seen this, huh? I guess I'm the only one that ever worked out amongst the world and lived amongst them all, huh? Had to vex my soul, amen. Had to fight those things, have did those things, had to cleanse my heart of those things. Amen. And it's in the Word of God. And I was amazed when I started, because I'm trying to think how long ago it was. The Lord just gave me that thing, blessing, curse, not many, I'm almost saying about half a year, a little bit longer ago. And I just thought, and, then, and, and God is faithful. Because at the same time, he said, right, right about, matter of fact, he took me through some rejection. He took me through some rejection. Rejection. He said, more is going to come. He's going to be rejected more and more. And then he had said, you cannot curse. You must bless. If you will inherit a blessing, you've got to do it. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 1. I want to read something from you. I want to read from scriptures. Man is in God's image. Man is in the image of God. You start cursing. For long you'll be cursing man. For long you'll be cursing God. There is a... Exactly right. If there's anything this generation is going to try and get it, it's going to try and get us to curse. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. I know what it, Every, every, when you fight spiritual battles, you, when something riles you up, when something upsets you, 
when somebody does something to offend you, when somebody does something against you, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? And your corner mind is revile them, boy. Get back, man. I'm going to. Oh, don't tell me. Y'all just never have thought coming like that, huh? That's the first thing. And then you've got to bring it captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, what did Christ say? Did he say, bless them that curse you? Amen. Did the apostle Paul say, bless and curse not? How about James saying, how about Peter? Did he say anything on this? We're going to get to what Peter said. But I'm going to go back to Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. See, the wisdom of man versus God's wisdom. See, the wisdom of God is wiser than the foolishness of men. Or the foolishness of God, I should say the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of all men. The foolishness of God. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25 through 27. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to the confound the things which are mighty. You know, I was praying, you know, and because I, I was asking God about bitterness. I was saying, Lord, I don't want to be bitter. And how can you keep me from being bitter. What can I do? And I sought the Lord. I just seeking the Lord. I mean seeking the Lord and asking him because I want to, because I guarantee you there's a tremendous spirit of bitterness that's working in the midst of God's people today, out there and here. And everybody that's got any sense to admit it is fighting against it. And that's the truth. And I don't care if you buy it or not. Amen. Because it's because if, if, if the devil can get bitterness, just one little root of bitterness. We talk about the little mint. How they just plant one little sprig every few feet and give it about six or eight months and it's got the whole bed covered. That's what bitterness is like. Just one little root of bitterness. It's like that sprig. It's like that mint. It just shoots out and before you know it, it's all covered. Amen. And many are the thousands. There's something about it. And see, and I'll just pray. The Lord says, He says, bless. And I said to the Lord, I said, it don't make no sense. It's stupid. I said, it's stupid. It makes no sense. The person don't deserve a blessing. Amen. I don't feel like giving them a blessing. See, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just trying to be honest with you. I'm just trying, and, I was, and, I was, and I was trying to be, Lord, I want to be absolutely honest with you, Lord. And the Lord said, I'm not doing it for their benefit. It's for your benefit. You ain't going to do them no good by it. But you're going to do yourself a whole lot of good. And I said, Lord, there must be some other way. He said, there is no other way. I don't care whether you buy it or not. You're fighting bitterness. There's only one way to stop it. That's to bless. 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 First Corinthians chapter 4. It's, it's amazing. It talks about the foolishness of God. Wiser than men. First Corinthians chapter 4. I want to go to the book of First Corinthians. I want to read a few scriptures. Verse 9 through 14. I can remember one time, I remember one time when I was in Argentina. And, it, and I'll tell you what, you know, the Bible says testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And the Bible talks about the word of God, by them is thy servant warned, and the keeping of them is their great reward. Alrighty? And I, I, now I don't know about everybody else, but many a times I've been saved from a lot of situations because God has showed me beforehand what's going down. And Lord, I would have been rolled over. I would have been steamrolled because it come with such force. <laughs> it would, if I wouldn't have been seeing watching, it would just steamrolled over. That's the truth. I mean, I don't know about you. Maybe you're just all, you know, right there all the time, and, you, you know, your footing's just all perfect, you know what I'm saying, and everything that comes against you, you just nothing ever would steamroll over you. Amen. But if you're all that way, Lord bless you. Amen. That's good. I'm not all that way. Amen. If certain things hit me at certain times, if I'm caught off guard, 
I'm in trouble. All right. And this is great. I, I had a good fellowship one place. I'm praying. We're just going to be there tonight. Amen. I pray. The Lord said, man, you're going to be rejected. I thought, Lord, can not be. Man, this fellowship was so good. That I said, no way. You know, I think my Lord said, you're going to be rejected. And after you're rejected, I want you to pray for a little boy. All right. And I said, whatever. Sure enough. I mean, the, the, the pastor got there, boy. And as soon as he got there, boy, just. I, I share the inspiration, but I mean, just reject, rejection. And I guarantee you, I mean, because it was so, man, if, if God would not have warned me, <laughs> I mean, I would have looked in his face and I probably, I probably would have, I probably would have bowed the man just because of the attitude he took. But the Lord had warned me, so I just, I just smiled. And I just believed with my adversary quickly, and I just, and I stayed there. And God opened the door. A couple opened their house, gave us the key, and we stayed in their house that night. Isn't that something? From that church. From that place, <laughs> God did. You know, and then we got a chance to share with them. But I'm just saying, I can remember if I wouldn't have been warned beforehand, understood what's coming out. I would. That time, I, I probably would have been overcome by it. You know, saying just would. But God's faithful; He tries to warn us. That's what all these epistles are. For by them is Thy servant warned. See, believe it or not, I'm trying to warn you tonight of what's going on in the spiritual realm. What's coming down more and more. Because this spirit is going to come more and more. You see, it's just like, just like Brother Stair was mentioning about a woman being raped. Or somebody else being this or do, having these things persecuted. See, don't make no, you can't, you, so what the body doesn't make no difference. See, but, but, but if the hatred comes up in your heart. See, but, but if the reviling is there. That's what defiles a man. See, it's, it's, it's not what goes into man, but what comes out of the mouth. It's these things that will defile a man. It's that way will defile a man. See, that's where the battle's going to be. Hey, we're talking about we're going to be perfect. Amen. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man. And that don't mean people won't get offended by what you're saying. But if you don't offend them, it's just like Jesus offended many, but it wasn't, it, he, he wasn't offensive. They took offense because of where their heart was at. But I want to show something. I'm not going to do it tonight. But I got in the second half of this. From whence cometh bitterness. Amen. From whence cometh. Where does this thing come? And there is a way that it comes. I want to get to that in the second half. Because it's important that we know. Why? So that we don't be the cause of offense. Because woe unto the man by whom the offense cometh. There's a woe to both. Amen. It's just there. First Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 9 says this. For this, I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last. As it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. Isn't that something? Apostle Paul understood something about his calling. Amen. And therefore, he didn't get disillusioned. Remember that word, disillusion. Verse 10. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor working with our own hands being... Now he's talking about this foolishness. Why is he a fool? He's going to tell you why he's a fool for Christ. Why he's weak. It's because of what he does. He says, And labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. He says, not stupid. That's foolish. But that's the foolishness of God, which is stronger than men. We bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Now, if we just suffer it. If we're being defamed, we entreat. In other words, somebody defames us, we entreat them. We just say, come a little closer. Let's draw near. Huh? Can I feed you a steak? Huh? If thou an enemy hunger, feed him. Amen. Well, for his benefit? Amen. God eventually going to put coals on top of his head. Amen. It's for your benefit. It's for, your, you know, it's for your benefit. You know, I, I thought about this. You know, Jesus said, you know, Peter said, hey, Lord, what if my brother 
sins against me seven times in a day. He said, what should I do? You know? She said, you know, should I forgive him seven times? She said, hey, if he does it against you 70 times seven and comes and says to you, I repent, you ought to forgive him. Now, I don't care what you say. Nobody that does that 70 times seven is sincere in heart in one day. Now, you can say anything you want, but they're not sincere. Maybe in a week, maybe in a month, maybe in a lifetime, but somebody that would do that 70 times seven in one day to you is not a sincere person. Their heart is evil and wicked in some way. No, see, we try and make it, no, that's the truth. Be wise as a serpent. Understand the situation. But be harmless as a dove. Don't let there be no guile or bitterness. No, forget the man. Why? For your sake, not for his. You're not going to help him one bit. A man that would do something 70 times 7 in one day and come back and say, oh, I repent. You ever see, I've seen that. I've seen that. Have you ever seen the spirit? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No more sorry than nothing. Satan is using them 100% to try and rise up bitterness in the heart of a person. Amen. Amen. I've seen that sorry spirit. And Jesus said, when you see that thing, you forgive them though. But don't be stupid. Don't think they're sincere because I don't buy they are. But you be smart enough. You be wise enough to forgive them for your sake. I don't know. Maybe you all never seen that. Man, I've seen people use that to absolutely try and frustrate somebody and absolutely try and destroy somebody. It's that false humility type of garbage. Ain't no more false. And you can just, you just watch it sometimes. So there's just a little, I have a little bitty smirk in the corner of the face. Just be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Don't be stupid. Don't be bitter. Just forgive them, bless them. See, because he goes on to say, I write unto these, write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Chapter 4, verse 4. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I missed that. But I, I won't pass it by. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. You know, one place Apostle Paul said, Anybody you have forgiven, I forgive them in the person of Jesus Christ. And he said, I do this lest Satan should get an advantage over us. Lest Satan should get, for, he said, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Now, I just told you one a device that Satan's used. I'm telling you a couple of devices that he uses. He said. I'm going to get into that more next time. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Now, the Bible says, if you have bitter envy and strife in your heart, glory not, and don't lie against the truth. Because this wisdom descends not from above, but it's earthly sensual endeavors. Now, don't glory, and don't lie against. There's just something about that spirit. It lies against the truth. It's dangerous. But if I, I want to show you, it was in the first, it was in Corinthians. This is why Apostle Paul dealing in Corinthians. But if I, I want to show you, First Corinthians chapter 6. He said, no, ye not, verse 9. That the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And he said, right there, revilers. Amen. Revilers will not inherit the king. He said, and such were some of you. He said, you were that. He says, but now you're a new creature in Christ. If any man be a new, old things are passed away. All things are become new. Let me go on to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. See, because they was teaching in Corinthians that you could do this kind of thing. Yes, they were. They was teaching that. Come on, man. They had a man in their lane with his own mother. His own husband's wife. He says, and you, 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 you don't mourn. You, 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 you boast and you glory in the thing. They're saying, hey, have you heard about what Joe did? Murmur about, talk about. 
Amen. Gossip about. Yet they, nobody judged it. And they all just thought, hey, old Joe's going to just make it on in. Go cruise on down the line. Finally, the Apostle Paul said, hey, man, anybody do these things, I don't care what they say, the Apostle Paul said, they're not going to enter God's kingdom. Right. It's just that clear. Matter of fact, it got to be, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, it got to be now. I mean, they're filled with the Spirit's gifts. There was healing. There was tongue talk and, and everything else going on down the line. There was prophecy and all things down. It got to be to where it was just like, I mean, to think that Apostle Paul would even, to, you don't understand how bad it, to think he would have to make a statement like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Listen to what he says. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. See, know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand. In other words, I want you to understand something. No man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. I mean, in the Corinthian churches, there were people going around cursing Jesus and saying they was doing it by the Holy Ghost. And the Apostle Paul finally said, I don't care what calling they say they got, whether they call themselves anything, prophet, apostles, let them acknowledge that this is a commandment of God. No such thing they are not going to enter. It's not right. No man does it because Jesus is cursed by the Spirit of God. It's the carnal man. Amen. It's not right before God. But they actually were letting it kind of just think about it and say, hey, man, must be all right. I mean, man's under the unction of the Spirit. Apostle Paul, apostolic authority. You know, he might have been a little old man. Amen. See, but he had authority. See, and that, that's why I believe something about the apostle's authority. I, I, I believe God entrusted them with something he never entrusted with no other ministry. And he will not entrust them. That ability to establish foundation doctrine. And that is the apostle's job. And that's what they did. And no man can change. The apostle's doctrine cannot do it. Only an apostle. That's it. Amen. Matthew chapter 26. That's right. It, it was so founded. Apostle Paul said, if you hear me come back a couple years later, start preaching another gospel, you don't listen. Just let me go on my way. I'll be accursed. I'll be accursed. Let him be accursed. Just Amen. Matthew 26. I know what I'm talking about here. I don't care whether you agree or not. I fought this thing. I finally shared an experience I had one time. I got so hot, boy. I'm talking about mad. I'm talking. I mean, I, I shared it. Where my body was physically hot for three days. And what it was, I was burning with bitterness. And it was like a consuming fire. Shut up in my bosom. Can a man take fire in his bosom and not get burned? I know that's talking about adultery too, but there's other kind of fire. Amen. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity set on fire hell. I mean, it's like a fire. I was in my bosom. Just literally until my body got hot for three days and nights. Martha knows. She remembers that situation. I don't know if she knew how far, far I was, but, man, I knew how far I was. And she, she, I mean, all she had to do was look on my face and she should have been able to see something. Amen. I know she saw something. I said, don't say a word, man. Shut up. <laughs> there's only one hope you know there's only one hope for, for bitterness that there was the bitter waters even that Moses come to and he took a stick and threw it in there's only one hope for bitterness even when, when they were in the, in the wilderness and the, the serpent fiery serpents bitter And the only thing they could do is they could look at that brazen serpent that Moses made. And Jesus said, as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted. Why? The, 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 them fiery serpents, because you were about to talk about the poison of ass, talk about cursing and bitter, poison of ass. That's that serpent's bite. And I might get into it, Lord, but next time. But that's that serpent's bite. And there's only one thing that can move it, and that's a trip to Calvary. That's it. I mean, there is nothing you can do I can remember when I went through that experience, I can remember I even sat, I don't know how I did, I sat through a service. 
I sat through a service, maybe two. And that, I mean, I could just feel, but that still couldn't break it. And finally, in the week, alone with God, I got on my face. And somehow I touched that cross. Amen. And, and, and it sucked that venom out. But I remember it, it was a terrible, and I, and I don't know, you may have never experienced anything like that, but everybody has fought it to some extent and degree. But it had me, and I'll tell you what happened, because I was disillusioned. Because I was, I was offended, and I was disgusted, because I was doing something, and I wanted to go a certain way, and I wanted to accomplish a certain way, and it didn't go that way, and it kept going the other way, and I got so disgusted and offended and tired, that's what happened. And I'm telling you, disillusionment. When you become disillusioned, you're in trouble. Yes, you are, because disillusionment causes offense. And the Bible says, talks about a wounded spirit, and that means a brother offended is harder to be won. His contention is like a bomb, can we, we, and that, what is it? That wounded spirit. An offense is when you're wounded in your spirit. And that wounded spirit, who can bear it? Nobody can bear it. Ain't nobody can do nothing for it. Ain't nobody can hold it up. There's only one place. It's the cross. It's Calvary. That's it. Matthew 26. It's coming, people. We haven't seen nothing yet. We have not seen nothing yet. Matthew 26. We just have little experience. 31. 35 says, it then says Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. He talks with disciples. Page 12. He says, Every one of you 12 are going to be, be offended by me tonight. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into God. Peter answered and said unto him, No man shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. I can picture him. He just said, Hey, Lord. Hey, but he said, No way, Lord. Uh-uh, man. I am sticking this thing out to the death. I'm with you. You can count on me. You can trust in me. Huh. I no way. Hey, man. Jesus was smart. He knew what was in man, and he did not commit himself to any man because he knew what was in man. Cursed is the man that trusteth in man. Get it. I ain't going to trust you no man. I'm going to trust the eternal God. Amen. Peter says, that's what Peter was trying to say, no? I'm not going to offend you. Count on me. Right here. Don't count on me. You trust me, you're stupid. Amen. You can count me out. Then you'll get along just fine. Because when I do something that seems out of order to you and out of, out of sync to your mind and crazy, you won't get offended by it. You say, I didn't have no trust in him in me. I, I knew he was just like flesh like me. Amen. That's right. Just count me out. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee Likewise also said all the other disciples. In one place he said, he spake even more vehemently, saying, I'll never deny you. Remember back in James? I told you to remember a word now. Boastful. 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 Oh, Peter was boastful. And this thing to the end. You know, I, I learned something years ago. There, there, there's, I believe in testifying. I believe that. I believe the testimony you're going to overcome. But I've watched, there's certain types of testimony. I can remember watching years ago. I see certain people get up, boy, and it just seemed like they were going. There was just a certain thing about their testimony. They said, thank God. I'm living for God. I'm committed. I'm going all the way with the Lord. I'm going to do this thing. I'll be here. A couple weeks later, there's the one that was gone. Hey, Amen. I noticed something about that. I don't know if y'all, I'm, I'm not talking about, and I believe in testifying, and, and, but, but there was just a certain thing. And, and what it was, it was the element of boast in it. There was something a little bit different. You know what I'm saying? And just, and I would, I would watch it. I mean, a couple weeks later, boom. You know what I'm saying? And I just noticed, I thought, Lord, what in the world is going on there? See, 
And then there's the other thing, they get up and testify. But see, but there was a different spirit about it. And of course, the Lord would just strengthen and bless them, and they'd be stable. And they'd go on and walk on with the Lord. But Peter would boast. I want to go on to chapter 26, verse number 69. Oh, Peter. Do you understand why they were all offended? Why were they offended? Sure, they were disillusioned. Matter of fact, you read over in Luke later on, where the two, after, the, after Jesus was died, Sunday morning, there's two walking on the road, Jesus appeared to them, they didn't know he was, and they said, today's the third day, and we thought that this would be he, you know, the Savior, there's going to be something, but, he, but then he died, he's in the grave. And well, what happened? They become, why? Because they become disillusioned. Why? Because had, they had the wrong illusion. In other words, they had the wrong dream. Or they had the long, wrong vision of what God was doing. See, that's why the people that's waiting for this rapture thing. That's what I'm saying. You ain't seen bitterness yet. Can you imagine? They're all thinking you're caught up. Can you imagine when this thing comes and he's a square in the face? The disillusionment. And you know what they're going to be? They're going to be bitter. Haven't you ever did that? I did that. I just did that. There's one project I mentioned. Man, I just, I thought the Lord was going to, and I wanted to turn out a certain way. It just didn't turn out how I thought and how I wanted to turn out. And it offended me, and, and I got bitter. Why? Because of disillusion. See, and that's what happened to all the apostles. See, they thought he was going to set up his kingdom. They still didn't understand that he had to die, that, that he was going to face weakness, that he was crucified through weakness. And through this weakness, God was going to confound the world and overcome all the strong things of the world and the strongholds of sin and the strongholds of iniquity. That through the weakness of the cross, that God was going to cleanse men and purge men and perfect men. They still didn't see that. And they was looking for the Messiah as the king that was going to set up his kingdom at that time and reign and military power and over going to come and they're going to establish a kingdom on the earth at that time. And so when he was on the cross and he died and buried, they were disillusioned. And this is what happened when he was, here's Peter. When Jesus is going, they're beating him and they're doing everything. Verse 69, after they beat him, he's going to the cross. Verse 69, now when Peter sat without in the palace and a damsel came unto him saying, Thou also was with Jesus of God. But he denied before them all, saying, I knew not what thou, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was going out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow also was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. I don't know. Huh? He is, he's a, don't know the man, heard his name, but don't know who he is. Don't know who he is. Hide a little bit. The one come by, and after a while came unto him, they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art also one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Listen to that verse. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately caught Christ. Can you see that? See, me? That's what Peter comes from. Peter was a reviler. And such were some of you. Some of us fornicators, some of us adulterers, some of us diviners, some of us idolaters. That's what it, but look what happened. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus which said, Before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me. And he went out and wept bitterly. He, he did what was right. He did what was right. He didn't glory. See, old Job experienced it too. You know, the first thing Job did when <laughs> he went through it, I'm not going to get into it. John chapter 16. Right. Got a few more. Job went through it. You know that? Do you know Job went through that? And, and the first word that, you know, chapter one, two of Job says, it, In all this, Job sinned with his, not with his mouth nor charged God. Foolish. That was after he lost everything. That was before his friends come now. That was not in chapter 38, 39, and 40 of Job. That was in the beginning of the book of Job. He did just fine for a while. You know what I'm saying? He lost all the physical things, did all right. But that was only chapter 2. <laughs> Starting out with chapter 3, you got to read the, the 
first verses of chapter 3, Job. I just went through Job. I said, Job didn't understand what in the world was going on. Amen. And, and, and he got bitter. He got bitter. But finally, when the eternal God appeared unto Job, amen, God broke it. God crumbled it. Amen. God, God had mercy on Job. Just like I thank God he had mercy on my soul. John chapter 16. I want to read the first one. It's coming to you. Can you imagine beating up on your wife? Government coming, brutally beating up your wife, killing your children. The Bible telling you to bless them. Can you do it? First Peter chapter 2. See, First Peter, chapter 2, verse 21 to 20. For even here unto, <clears throat> I'll start with verse, verse 19. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrong. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well, and suffer for it, <clears throat> you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. You remember on the cross was the last shot that Satan had to get to Jesus at that time, in that situation. Right. Now my question is, once he finally got him on the cross, what, was, what did he want Jesus to do? Did he try to get Jesus to live or to die? To live. That's your right. He tried to get Jesus to live. He mocked him, he reviled him, they blasphemed him, they made him their joke, they did everything. Why? If thou be the Christ, come on down. And, and we'll know. Why? Why? See, he finally got him on the cross. Yeah. He, but when he got him there, see, Satan knows his word. <laughs> he knows his word like a book. He knows it better than we know it. He knows it better than we do. He knows it. And then when he finally, he, he realized, man, if this is the Lamb, this is the one Isaiah. He, he had more sense than them Jews had. This is that one Isaiah. And I better get him down off there. I just get him to come down. And so he tried to do everything he could to rile up the spirit of Jesus. So that Jesus said, I'm going to show you I'm the Son of God. No, no, I just want to prove who I am. Do you want to see what I'm saying? He wouldn't do it anymore. He just killed his peace. He just killed his peace. He said, Father, forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. See, this is the key. There are people that operate under the power of Satan to put bitterness in their heart. Now, you can't hate them because they're deceived. They don't know what they're doing. I mean, but don't kid yourself. You can watch the expressions, the action, everything they do. There is a mastermind behind them. Amen. There is a master spirit behind them, and you cannot outgun it. You cannot outsmart them. There's only one thing you can do is God's Word. That's it. If you do God's Word, you win. If you try and think anything around it, try to overcome it any other way, you're going to lose. But you've got to understand, it's not them. It's the Spirit. There ain't no flesh and blood you wrestle with or I wrestle with anywhere, any place. It's the Spirit. It's ever known. Everybody's been used one time or another by a Spirit. You know? But if we love God, we begin to look at that and say, hang on a minute, I don't want to be a, a stone of stubborn. In other, in other words, I don't want to be offensive. I don't want to cast a stone before my brother to make him stumble. You know what I'm saying? When we look at that, then God will help us. First Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. And 10. First Peter. I wanted to get to these, this book of Peter and that's it. I, told you, I mean, all the apostles talked about this. It ain't nothing new, but it's going to be more paramount in our day. It is. It is. It's coming more and more. This world's getting harder 
The love of many is waxing cold. Why? Iniquity is abounding. The love of many is waxing cold. The Bible warned us. Men, it's coming down the line. First Peter chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. Amen. I'll start with 8. Finally be all of one mind, having compassion one on another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for rail. But contrary wise blessing. Knowing that ye are there unto call. That ye shall, ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. And his lips that they speak no God. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and eschew it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are open unto their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And he's talking about right there about rendering evil for evil or railing for evil. He says, you do that. He says, the face of God is going to be against you. See, God's not mocked. See, he said, you want to bless? Why? Because you inherit a blessing. I guarantee you. Every blessing you put out, come back on you. Amen. Every reviling you put out, come back on you. Every curse you do, God's not mocked now. What you sow, everyone you sow, come back on you on your body, on your family, on your children. Amen. That's something to think about. Every blessing you put out, you're going to reap it. It's the same thing. What we reap, we sow. But it, it's just coming. I, I, really. Jesus is the example. The body of Christ. The last thing he faced. You know, and you, you can look, you, you can study some of the people that was tortured. And it wasn't the physical torture that was hardest. I mean, that was terrible. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to downplay it. But, 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 but what was more dangerous, it was, it was the incessant type of mocking that, that tried to get them to react in a manner that was contrary to the word of God. And that was the hardest thing. See, that was the hardest thing with Jesus. And that's what he was tempted on in his final moment. But it's coming. He said, I've told you these things beforehand. For what cause? That you will not be offended. See, he that loves God's word, nothing, nothing, nothing shall offend him. So you know why we're offended? We, we just don't love it. Like we are. And we, do, we just don't want to do it but like God wants it done. You know what I'm saying? But when we love it, when we, when we, when we discern it's God's will and say that is God's way, so be it. That nothing will offend us. We're not going to be offended by it. See, but, but, but if we don't love it, if we just want to do it a little different, or if we think it ought to be done a little different. Word of the Lord. Word of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12. Huh? Verse 14. 14. Amen. The word of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12. Huh? Verse 14 and 15. And then we're going to go to the book of Titus. Amen. Verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently. There's that word diligent. Amen. That old word diligent. Diligent. Looking diligently. And what are we supposed to look? Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. Fail of God's grace. You know, there's a lot of things you can fail. And you can make it up. But if you ever fail God's grace, you're finished. That's the truth. I'm going to show you something tonight. Lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness bringing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Let's go to, to the book of Titus. You know, I'm telling you, if you fail God's grace, you're finished. That's what it says right there. He said that when, when he failed God's grace, there was no place of repentance. And so if you fail God, we can fail in many things. 
Amen. And who hasn't failed in a lot of things? Amen. I can count my share. I failed in many things. Amen. But if I ever fail of God's grace, then, that, then I'm done. Amen. And you see, because grace is a teacher, the Bible says. Let's go to the book of Titus. Grace is a teacher. Amen. In other words, grace sets up a classroom. Amen. And grace has lessons. And they got lesson number one, lesson number two, lesson number three, and on down the line. Amen. And if you fail the teaching of God's grace, especially if you fail lesson number one, then you're never going to go on. Amen. And that's just the word of the Lord. Titus. Chapter, I want to start with chapter number two, I guess. Verse 11 and 12 says this. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. Amen. There's grace to teach us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, lesson number one. Righteously, lesson number two. Godly, lesson number three, in this present world. Titus chapter number two. Now let's go with verse one through six. You know what the first lesson is in grace? Teaching us that denying us godliness and worldly lusts, that we should live how? Soberly. That's the first lesson of God's grace. Sober. Yes, it is. I'm talking tonight about bitterness. Amen. Because the Bible says, lest any man fail of God's grace, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby leading you to find them. I guarantee you this world is, is filling up right now with bitterness. It is filling with bitterness. And it is going to get worse. The Bible says the curse will be poured out upon the earth. And that curse is a venom. Amen. That is going to bite. And it's going to spread through this earth. And it's going to be bitterness. And the reason being is because they fail of God's grace. See, when the Bible talks, talks you know, we hear about the door of grace being called, that means been failed of God's grace. Now, that means men have so miserably, they fail of God's grace that God finally just shuts the door and says, there's not enough students in class, we're going to close this down. Have you ever heard that example? They're doing that a lot anymore. They say, we're going to have class. We're going to have it. But if we don't have over six students, the class is canceled. Amen. And it's why? Because there's a faith. See, and we'll get to the point where the whole world's going to fail of God's race, and there's going to be a bitterness that's going to sweep through the face of the whole earth. You've already seen it. As a matter of fact, I've mentioned something. Every time we travel, I, I, when I go into the land, I, just walking down the street, the, the, one of the hardest things we have to fight, and Martha knows, is just walking down the street, you know, this hatred. I mean, we just be walking down the street, not saying nothing, not saying nothing, they're just glaring at you. There's just a hatred in their eyes. I'm, that's the truth. Martha knows. I mean, you, you, and you've got to be careful, man. You can't mind let it affect your spirit. You just got to look over it. You just got to look beyond it. You just got to keep your eyes on the prize. Amen. You got to keep your mind in place. Amen. You got to be diligent, lest you fail of God's grace. And Titus chapter two. I want to start with the. I want to start with chapter one, verse sixteen. I want to go back there. Amen. It says, "But they profess that they know God." Uh -huh. But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Right. They profess that they know God. I'm, I'm talking about, about people that profess to know God. Amen. That name the name of Christ. Amen. But how do you deny God? You deny him in your works. In what you do. And I want to get into that in a minute. But, but chapter 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now he's talking about what God's grace teaches. And then the first thing he says is, the aged men sober. Then he goes on down to verse 4, that they, they may teach the young women to be sober. And then verse 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober. And then the first thing he says, the very first thing, now he's talking about God's grace. Because it goes on in verse 11 and 12, talking about the grace of God which appeared to us teaches us. And the first thing it teaches us, and the first thing he commanded Titus to tell the people, be so. Be so. Be so. I want you to go with you to the book of Acts. Why? I'm telling you. I told you.
bitterness come from last time? One way. There's two ways. Now, and I'm, I know you, a lot of people ain't going to buy it, but I'm going to show you from the Word of God. One is from disillusion. One is from disillusion. They become disillusioned. Things don't work out like that. They get bitter. Amen. Who has not faced that? Who has not had to fight against that? Amen. I'm going to tell you where another, another place of bitterness. I'm not going to say this is only two places. I'm going to say these are two major things. The other one is foolishness. Foolishness brings a lot of bitterness. Yes, it, 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 and I'm going to prove to you from the word of God. See, that's why if any man fails, God's grace. Amen. And the first thing grace teaches you is what? Soberness. And so if you let that foolishness come in, you fail. You fail. You fail. By the grace of God. And there is a root of bitterness that will begin to operate in your life. Though it may be covered. And it will spread out and seek to defile. Amen. It's the word of God. I won't prove it. I want to. I want to read a scripture. I forgot. Second uh, Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy. I have the scripture written down, but I. But I didn't bring it with me. Hmm? But it talks about if we deny him, if we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. All right. Now I want to. I want to. I want to because the Bible talks about in in. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Right? And I want to talk to you, you know, I, I, I watched for years, and especially in our generation. You see, we come through a very powerful revival years ago, and that's true. That is the truth. I mean, this, I can even remember, and I just got on the tail end, but I can remember the little church I went to 15 years ago. I mean, resurrection of the dead, casting out of devils, every type of healing, miracle, deliverance. It's just a little church. But the people saw God, got on their face. But I mean, it was there. And so there has been a work. And in the midst of that, God raised up a lot of anointed vessels. He gave out a multitude of gifts and an abundance of callings. And that is the truth. And now what you were, and, and this is what we got to be, what we're seeing today is we're seeing the fruit with it. We are seeing the fruit wither. Amen. And yet you are still seeing the gift and the calling of God operate. Yes, you're doing it. I mean, there are, there are men out in this world that are living ungodly and filthy life. But God gave them a gift and he'll never take it away. And as a matter of fact, now listen to what I say. You don't have to buy it if you don't want it. But God's spirit will testify of the gift that he gave them. You can listen to them and you'll know that's the gift of God working. That's exactly right. You'll know it's God's gift. And you're stupid if you resist the gift. You've got to recognize the giver in the gift. But then you ought to be another, you ought to be careful and recognize too that the ungodly lifestyle they're living today is a lifestyle perversion. It's a reprobate lifestyle. But God will never deny himself that gift and calling. He'll never deny it. See, that's why it doesn't make a difference what people do if they judge a person's calling. The Lord showed me it don't make no difference what anybody said for or against you in your calling. I will not even deny your calling. I will not even judge you in your calling. Because I gave it and I'll never take it back. That's why people, you can't take it back. You can't judge somebody's calling. You don't make, you can say anything you want. I mean, you can pronounce it, whatever, it don't make no difference. It don't make an eye to it. Because God himself is not going to take it back. He will not do it. If we believe not, yet he about it, but he cannot deny himself. See, but if we deny him, we, he will deny us. See, that's what's coming down the line. This gift is operating, but he's going to deny them at the end. He's going to do it. See, and people got to understand. You know, it's like in the time of, of the Pharisees. Now, Jesus told you what the Pharisees were. He said, he said the Pharisees, he said, you fools. He said, you vipers. And your serpents. <laughs> I mean, what a thing. 
he was identifying what, what they were. And he, but he, what he said to his disciples, he said, now the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. He said, uh, in other words, they've been given that place. All things, whatsoever they bid you observe, observe it. Do it. He said, but don't do after their works, for they say and do not. In other words, what, what is actually happening, the, the men that are around today that are living life's yes, a godly lifestyle, they're still, oh, I watched it one time. I watched a man operating the gifts. I mean, just right on down. But the Spirit was so in God. I said, Lord, what in the world? He said, he's holding the truth and unrighteousness. And he said, don't reject the truth because of their unrighteousness that they're doing. Believe the word of God, whatever they bid you, do it. But just don't do after their works. You see what the devil's doing? He's getting a lot of people to actually reject the word of God because of what they see people living. I don't care how a person is. If they speak truth, it's truth. Believe the truth. Believe to the word of God. Obey the word of the Lord. But don't walk in the unrighteous deed. I'm telling you, this failing of the grace of God, amen, and I'm talking about, and Jesus identified the scribes and Pharisees as fool. I'm telling you, it's a reprobate spirit. You know why we're having so much, I, I, I saw a little article the other day, I read it. They have juveniles going in and out. Some of them have two and three dozen, 25, 30, 35, 40 different convictions. I'm talking about convictions. Armed robbery, rape, all kinds of things. And they'll just keep recycling and bringing them back and recycling them and letting them go and recycle them until violence is filling the land, the streets are filling violence, blood breaketh out. And you know why? One of the reasons why the people still have hope and they're stupid because when that people do things like that, they're reprobate. I mean, we're living in a reprobate, but people still have hope. And I'm going to tell you, one of the most dangerous things you can have is a false hope. And when the Bible says, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. This whole nation is sick because it still hopes and thinks that there's going to be a turnaround, and it's reprobate, and it will not turn around, and therefore there is a sickness, there is a depravity, there is something that has taken the mentality of the nation, the national conscience, and it's a hope that is false. And it's breeding a depravity, a sickness, a wound, a corruption. I'm telling you, and what they need to do, they need to face up to the fact that the situation is hopeless, and what they ought to do is judge them severely and harshly. That's exactly what should be done. Except it must end, but it won't be done. And the old criminals, boy, they're smart. They know how to play the game now. Maybe they don't go in. And some of them might even put out a few tears. Some of them might not. Some might study their little book and be out two, three, four weeks. That's exactly right. Re they're rehabilitated. And then they got 20 or 30 more convictions. They keep on going. Keep on going. It's a false hope. False hope. Acts chapter 8. Tell it. Talking about bitterness. See, because if you think somebody's going to, I'm telling you, the spirit that Jesus dealt with in the scribes of Pharisee, he dealt with the spirit of mockery. He dealt with the spirit of scorn. He dealt with the spirit of foolishness. He called them fools. He identified, he wasn't just calling names, he identified them for all posterity. I can't get that across to people's heads. People just think Jesus was just, no, he identified for all posterity, all people in the future age, what was going down there. And he made it absolutely clear that he could not do anything. And that is why he did not become bitter against them. If he would have had any hope for them, he would have bred bitterness. He would have bred a sickness in him. But he knew that the blind lead the blind they fall, fall into the ditch, period. He didn't say there was any hope for them. He flat out said, the damnation of hell awaits you, you vipers, and you serpents. Why? Because they were filled with a venom and a poison. And that venom and poison was bitterness. And it proceeded from their foolishness and their fault. I'm going to prove it. 
from the Word of God. And Jesus could very easily say from the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Why? Because he understood what they were, who they were, and he believed in the righteous judgment of his Father. Because it said, he reviled not, but he committed himself to him. That does what? That judges right. He knew there was no way the eternal God was going to back off his word. God's word already made their damnation. You see. You see. You see. If you ever hope that a fool's going to change, you're going to be filled with bitterness. You might as well mark them off. Because there will be no change. Either that or you might as well throw the word of God out the door. Because the Bible says. I'm admonished. We better be careful because this spirit is sweeping. Sweeping the world. This world is getting, I mean, things are going bad, but the world, the honky tonks are gone, the bars are more, the entertainment places are more and more and more and more. Amen. Just going more on. Acts chapter 8. Amen. Hope deferred. You know why people get frustrated a lot of time with people? Because they hope. If I didn't have no hope in nothing, it would bother me then. But people hope, and the devil deceives them. There's a time where there is no hope. You know, God does cut off. And, and if you hope that that gets changed, then it's going to make you sick. You're going to be in trouble. You're going to be scared. But if you realize what's going on, then you just acknowledge the righteous judgment of God, commit yourself unto him, and don't worry about it. Because they're not a thing of the world. They're not a thing in the world nobody's going to do for this generation. There's not one thing, because this generation reprobate. There's a lot of people in church reprobate. They're in church now. They come to meetings. They're faithful. They give a lot of money. That's exactly right. They're diligent in a certain aspect. I mean, come on. All you got to do is look at scribes and Pharisees. Except your righteous. See, they're, they're, they're getting on pretty good. I mean, they're pretty diligent. And as far as what they're doing, they're doing all kinds of things. They sure appeared like they was godly. Amen. But they wasn't. Acts chapter 8. I'll start with verse number 18. It says this. And when Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. I'm going to go to back to verse 9. Let me read it. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Then verse 18. And when Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this manner, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Verse 22. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of now, now, why did Peter perceive that this old Simon, who offered him money, by what? For what? what? What was he after? What was Simon? He was after the gift. He was after. The, he wasn't after fruit now. He was just after the gift of God. See, and that's what's going down in our town today. There's a lot of going after the gift, the gift, but there's very little seeking to bring forth the fruit. The fruit. And I'm telling you, it brings it brings a certain spirit. It, it's a spirit 
And that's what's going on today. You can see it all over. And that's what's deceiving God's people. Because they're looking for the gift. They're looking. They're not looking. They're not desiring. They're not wanting to bear fruit. You know, and the Bible says that to him, Jesus talked in Matthew chapter 13. He talked about the sower that goes forth and sows the seed. He's talking about how it hits upon the four different grounds. It says the last one brings forth fruit. Amen. And all the others didn't bring no fruit for it. And then he goes on, take heed how ye hear, and take heed how ye judge. And then he says, for he that hath, to him shall be given. But he that hath not, shall be taken away even that which he hath. Now what in the world did he mean there? It's very simple. He, he just told him the parable of the sower. And he said, he that hath, he that's got the fruit. He that finally brought forth fruit. To him shall be given. What? He'll, give it. He'll be given a position, a place, and a calling in God's kingdom. He'll be given. But to him that hath not, hath not what? Then have no fruit. But that have maybe a calling. You bet every one of them had a calling now. And no doubt every one of them had a gift. But, but the first three brought forth no fruit unto perfection. And therefore, even that which they had, what did they have? They had a gift. But what did not they have? They had no fruit. So God even took away their gift and calling. So God is looking for fruit. Now I want to say that for a reason. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to First Timothy. Our Jews, let's go to Jews. I want to read you. Do. Right before Revelation. We're still talking about the same thing now. I'm going to be this evening. I'm talking about it. I just got different branches of the tree. Then I'm going to tie into the root. Let me connect to the trunk. And bring it down. You, I'm going to start verse 12, says, These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds, they are without water, carried about the winds, trees whose fruit wither. Without fruit. Hear that? That, that, that? There's the problem right there. Because it's without fruit. And he says, twice dead, puffed up by the roots. Now then go down to verse 16. Who's he wanted? These are murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaks great swelling words, having been personal admiration because of their advantage. But beloved, remember you the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, beloved, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. They don't have the Spirit, but they might have the gift, and they might have the call. Because they're twice dead. He didn't say they're one time dead now. He said they are twice dead. They're, they were born naturally and they were born again spiritually. They are twice dead. They've been plucked up by the day of fail of the grace of God. Then he tells you what they are. He said they're mockers. And the Bible says a fool make us a mock. See, he's telling you what they are. They just look on still with a fool. And they're going to be in the church, and they're going to come from the church. Because they are twice dead. Romans chapter 1. I want to stress that. They're twice dead. That means somebody that has known God, has been called of God, and has turned away from bearing fruit. But they may retain the call. That's God's truth. I'm, I'm telling you, I've traveled to different places. And people that, I say, Lord, they are just preaching, that's the word of God, just as, I mean, that's God's word. And even there's, a, yet, when there ain't no fruit, as God says, they're holding the truth in unrighteousness. In Romans chapter 1, I just want to read a couple of scriptures here, if I can. Romans 1, and I'm going to get to something. Verse 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Now, it's revealed from heaven, and his wrath is going to come upon this when he comes from heaven. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in un 
right now they hold it they know the truth but they hold it in righteousness spirits unrighteous. he says because that which may be made may be known of God is what is met is what is manifest where in them in other words that which may be known of God is manifest in them they God has manifested in himself in them how through his gifts through his calling through his spirit he has manifested himself if these are people that have known God I'm talking about a dangerous spirit people I'll never forget that I'll never forget when that brother told me about that vision he had about the, I've mentioned the five star and the four star general and, and how God took how the four star and five, I, I shared the vision here y'all heard what I said about that hey man a person had a, a cadet, man had a, a vision vision he saw a cadet in training saw a five star general four star general training this cadet and this cadet had a gun and the five star general you know said bring the gun down slowly and when you see the target squeeze the trigger and so he did it and he missed and the five-star general mocked him and so now he could not hit the broad side of a bump and the, and the four-star general that just mocked him the cadet turned around pointed the pistol in the face of the five-star shot him entered his mouth caught the back of his head hit the four-star general killed him both and the spirit of god says to the man three times who has the vision don't just don't just don't just as god was saying this thing will kill a five-star general, a four-star general, it'll, 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 it'll kill a seasoned preacher of the gospel. It'll wipe him out. It will put him outside of the kingdom of God. He'll die spiritually. He'll be twice dead, crushed up by the roots. But the thing about it, God will never, 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 until the day I die, if I go out and be a fornicator, a whoremonger, an adulterer, God will never take my calling from me. I will answer on the day of judgment for my calling. My soul will burn in hell because I have not worked out my own salvation with fear and trembling, and he will deny me, but he will not deny himself. And that's why people are deceived. And it's nature, it's our own fault. Because Jesus told us, by their fruit, not by their calling, not by their gifts, not by their dedication, not by their loyalty. Not because they pray, not because they fast, not because they did By their fruit, you'll know. We just don't want to believe the word of God. We just don't want to buy the word that it is that simple. It's just too simple. See, we 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 we, we don't feel right in judging somebody that seems to be very dedicated and bearing no fruit. Verse in Romans 1. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. But became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Neither were thankful. That's the beginning of it. See, that's failing God's grace. That's the beginning of failing of God's grace. That, that part of it. Not thanking God. Not being thankful. Not being thankful. Not being thankful. That sets you on the road. I mean, don't forget now, I'm not talking about they profess that they know Him. Oh Lord, I thank you. Amen. But it's in the works that they deny. I mean, God knows what you're thankful for. I mean, you can get up in church and say, Oh, I'm thankful that the Lord gave me such and such. You could be just as unthankful as you can be. And God knows me. You're not going to fool God. You ain't going to seriously deceive the Almighty. You forget about it. He, 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 he weighs the spirits. He makes me weigh spirit. I can't weigh spirit. God can weigh spirit. He weighs it. He's got a little balance there. He puts the spirit on. He says, Oh, you're weighing the balance. I want it. Your spirit now. And God can do it. I believe it. Hebrews 6 4 says, For it is impossible. And listen to what the Bible says here. For it is impossible. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, when a man fails in God's grace, it's a reprobate spirit. When you lose that sobri sobriety, soberness, 
you're on the road to reformation. And there is no place to repent. And I, 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 I defy, I defy anybody, because I got the word of God. And if they're going to defy the word of God, they can defy God's word. But the word of God's going to stand. And the Bible makes it clear. It says these are defying no place. The Bible makes it clear the spirit of folly and foolishness. It makes it clear, amen, that it is a reprobate spirit. You look back in Romans 1, you go back in the book of Proverbs. As a dog returns to it, it's fine. Fool. That's returned to his father. Oh, there might be a cosmetic change. Chameleon changes his color. But a chameleon is still a chameleon. See, God, there's only see, see, God's not interested in little changes. God is interested in a transformation of the spirit. Why? I'm telling you what the grace of God is. The grace of God is the divine nature of God manifesting in our lives. That is God's grace. The Bible says Jesus was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He came and He was full of grace and truth. Amen. What was He? He was full of all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Him Father. In Him the Father was pleased the Father. In Him should all fullness dwell. It was the divine nature. He was full of the divine nature. He was full of grace. God's divine nature. And the Bible says, to as many as received him, to them gave he power, or as we say, gave him the right to what? Become the what? The sons, the divine nature of God. So that's the question. This is where the failing of God's grace has nothing to do with a gift or a It has to do with failing the transformation into the divine nature of the Son of God. That's what it's at. That's what it's at. This is what Hebrews chapter 6 says. Now, listen. It says this. For it is impossible. Remember, I mentioned twice dead now. Twice dead means that they have been twice alive. A natural and a spiritual birth. Twice dead. They died the first time to their natural state. Do you know when we've been born again, we die out to ourselves? He's talking about people that actually died out, were buried with Christ, amen, then were raised again and walked in a new life of life, a rebirth. All right? So they'd already died once, been born twice. He said, then they died the second time. Then the second time, the spirit. It's just like, see, people, it's just like a parable. Sower sows the seed. And the seed is the word of God, it grows up, and then it becomes. And it what? It withers away. It dies. That's a spiritual life dying. Yeah, it can die. It can die. It can die. That's twice dead. Now, that's what it's talking about. Put it possible for those who are once enlightened, a taste of the heavenly, get from a partakers of the heavenly Holy Ghost, a taste of the good word of God and of the powers of the world to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repent. The same thing he's talking about further on. Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him an open shame for the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh often upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God but that which beareth no fruit and that which beareth thorns and bright that which beareth no fruit is rejected and is nigh to cursing whose end is to be burned I want you to turn with me if you will to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and it's not only, you know, we talk about fools, and we think they're just men. But the Bible talks about silly women laden with sin. And it's part of it too. The Bible talks about foolish woman is clamorous. She's simple and knows nothing. I mean, a fool can be either male or female, and they're just as dead. And they both breathe the same thing. They breathe bitterness. They breathe. They breathe. I'm going to show you about the God. Second Timothy chapter 3. I'm just going to mosey through some scriptures first. Verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sin. Silly women. They look it up and just Foolish women. That's all it means. Foolish women. Laden with sin. Led away with diverse love. Let me go on down the line. Verse number 13. 
See, first he started talking about the evil men. And then he started talking about the seducers. He said the evil men, they crawl and creep into houses, and they find the seducers. That's right. Silly women are the seducers. That's right. We always apply that to the, to the masters. But the silly women are the seducers. Verse number 13 says, but evil men and seducers. See, he's talking about both of what he mentioned there. He talked about the evil men that creep in the house, but they talk about the silly women that, that are inside the house that are the seducers. So he said, evil men and seducers. Oh, I, said, I don't believe that they're They're not, what, what, what did Revelation chapter 2 say? He said, that thou causes that woman to teach and to what? Seduce my servant. So women are seducers. Amen. And they're deceiving and being deceived. What happened with Eve? She was deceived. Amen. And then she deceived. She was deceived and then she seduced Adam. That's right. Even though he willingly would have did, but she just seduced him. I don't think he would have ate of the tree unless she would have brought. I don't think he would have did. All right, so the Bible says, First Timothy, First Timothy chapter 5. I'm telling you, it's a dangerous spirit. I'm going to go back off. I believe it's the most dangerous spirit that's walking the face of the earth. I believe it's the most dangerous spirit. And I, I, I'm never going to forget the vision that sister had. And I, I, I know why God sent me right to that house when I went there in Argentina. The sister had the vision of the flag at half mast and saw the clown above it. And God said, that is the God, not one of the God. That is the God of the United States. In a place they would not permit him. So, I want to say, you can fail God's grace. Bitterness actually comes to disillusion. It actually comes through foolishness. One of the reasons that foolishness brings bitterness is because people think they can change it, and they can't. And, they be, and, and, and actually, they become disillusioned. That brings foolishness. Bitterness. The Bible talks about foolishness and bitterness. Because of bitterness. The scriptures talk about, I find more bitter than death. The woman, the foolish woman. That's an admonition. We, we, we don't want to get to that point. We don't want to be there. And that's our mission. This world is, is like that all over. The churches are like that. God's people are going to be like that. That's right. Because there's hardly anybody. There's hardly, I, I travel, and I, there's hardly anybody that take a stand against foolishness. And that's the truth. That is the truth. That is the truth. You can travel, you can go anywhere. There's hardly anybody that take a stand. It's so full. And that's why, see, that's why God is even going to let the church burn. Amen. I mean, he's going to let it go through. Because why? Because it, it is it is so disgusting in his sight that he's going to put it through the fire. He's going to burn out the dross. Amen. And if he has to, he will destroy the righteous with the wicked. God said, if the righteous do not hear, I will destroy the righteous with the wicked. God will do it. So, don't be disillusioned. Amen. Don't get, no, don't get your hopes too high. Amen. Keep them at a proper level. Take the shield of faith. Amen. Well, what you can quench all the fiery darts of the world. And part of your faith is the ultimate judgment of God. I have faith that God will do all things in the time. He'll do it right. He's going to do everything right. Everything is right. He's going to do it. And that's my faith. And with that, I can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So rejoice. Give thanks. That'll keep you from starting on that road. Thank you. It's the God of the United States of America that I'm going to kill and destroy that man. And that judgment's on every individual that's got that spirit. God is going to. They will be twice dead. And God, they, you said they are reserved the blackness of darkness forever. See, now, now understand what I'm saying. That's why you can't do anything about it. You can do nothing. You can't change them. You can't help them. You can't judge them. You can do nothing. Why? Because God has said, I, these are my special. The Lord said, I have reserved the wicked, the evil, for a very special day. They're my, they're like an offering unto God. They're a special thing God has reserved for He Himself. And He's not going to let nobody take judgment on them. If you try to judge them, If you rebuke a scorner, you get to yourself shame. 
First Timothy chapter 5. The Bible tells the wise man contendeth with a foolish man, whether he rage or whether he laughs. There is no rest. What's what do you mean rage? Rage means rebuking him. You get off of I'm going to rebuke him and straighten him out. Rage at him. There ain't no rest for you. There's no mark. If you laugh with him, you can partake of the evil deed. And that's still mark. You may say no mark. Why? Because then he's got you. So all you do, you like the Bible forsake the foolish and live. Go on the way of understanding. That's all you do. That's what Jesus said. And if the blind need the find, just let them go on their way. Don't try and stop going into the ditch. Because they just drag you on in. Amen. Let him go on. Somebody wants to go on the dish, let him go. John had no compassion for him. I have nothing. Zero. And I'm not ashamed to say that. See, because God's going to laugh at him. And when he laughs, I'm going to join right in. I'm not going to laugh ahead of time. But I guarantee you, when I heard the first laugh out of the, first laughter out of the, out of the mouth of the Almighty, this man here is going to be right there with him. I'm going to be laughing. I'm not going to laugh ahead of time. Just wait. But when he laughs, I'm going to laugh with him. Amen. It's going to be like the wheel and the spirit of the living Amen. When the, when the creature went that way, the wheel fall. When the Lord goes that way, I'm going to be like the wheel. I'm going to fall right behind. That's right. In his footsteps, we shall fall. And so when he finally laughs, we too, if we're following in his footsteps now, it's part of our reward now. It's our reward. We just don't believe God's word on what he says about this. We, we, see, we're still convinced because of our upbringing. Amen. Because what we've learned for years in the natural mind. I mean, because most of the church is so full of it, and they're the people we think are good, nice people, and so still with folly and foolishness around God. We still don't believe God's word, what God's word says about it. I, come, I got a battle constantly. I mean, when I travel outside, I, I've got a battle. I got a battle everywhere, but I got, when I travel, I've got a battle. But, because if I look by my natural eyes, I mean, it'll deceive me. I've got to believe what God's word says. But if I got told me once, I said, if you don't believe that, what I've said in my word about that, it's going to damn your soul. That's why I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to First Timothy chapter 5. I'm going to believe the Word of God. And I'm going to believe it's a dangerous thing. I'm going to believe it's better for me to need a bear. Rob me of its well. I have a better chance of surviving than to need a fool in his folly. That's what the Word of God says. And I believe that just like it's written. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. It says this. And with all, talking about the younger widows, huh? Amen. Talking about women. And with all, they learn to be idle. Wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tablers also. And busy, but speaking things which they ought not. You know what tablers are? You look at the way. They just chatter. Chatter, 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 chatter. Chatter, 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 chatter. And they're busy. But well, what's going on with so and so? But what's so and so doing? What's such and such doing? That they're, they're wanting to get in everybody else's business. Instead of just doing their own business, they wander about idle, tatter, tatter. That means chatter. That means they chatter, they're talking, they're talking, talking, talking. And the Bible says what they are. Now listen to this. Now this is what the scripture says. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house. Guide what? Guide the house. You women just guide your house. That's enough. You keep your house in line. That's good enough. I mean, you don't have to worry about what somebody else is doing. I mean, there ain't, you don't got to worry about what no man is doing nowhere, no way. You don't even have to worry about what your husband's doing. Martha, you don't have to worry about what I'm doing. It, it makes no I, I've let her know, she don't have to worry about a thing about what I'm doing. She's not going to answer one iota for what I'm doing. She's going to answer for what she does in her house. She's not going to answer one iota for what happens on this community or anywhere else. She's going to answer for what happens in her house. That's it. That's her place of authority. That's her dominion. And then he goes on to say, he says this. He said that they guide the house, give an on occasion to the after to speak for poetry. For some are already turned aside after Satan. What are you talking about? He's talking about the busybody in Tatler. They're already turned aside after Satan. They done did fail something. They failed God's grace. And it's a dangerous thing. Don't let that spirit get on you. Because it's dangerous. And that's exactly what the scripture says. I want you to go with me to James. No problem. James says this, if any among you seems to be religious, kind of pious, kind of devoted, amen, kind of has some knowledge, and they bridle not their own to no profit, it's this, this, I mean, 
how much clearer can you get it? It's fair. They will not. This foolish spirit, not a foolish fool, whether male or female, they will burn in hell. There's nothing anybody can do to change that. You're fool yourself and deceived if you think you can change it. You're gonna damn your own soul. Okay, That's now that was that was a five or ten minute clip uh, that was missed in the first recording by mistake. Now flip over back to side one on tape two here. Turn this tape over and flip it over and rewind it all the way for the next 45 minutes, then flip it back again to this side for the last two minutes of the mess. Whether male or female, they will burn in hell. There's nothing anybody can do to change that. You're fool yourself and deceived if you think you can change it. You're going to damn your own soul. And that's the truth. God's not going to change his word. He's not going to do it. And this world is stilling. Filling, filling, filling every day more and more are falling away. There shall be a great falling away. Falling away from what? The grace of God. It's the people, he's talking about those that will be twice dead. And they're deceitful, man. Why? Because they know God. They know the ways of God. They know how to deceive God's people. They know how to work miracles. They know how to minister the gifts. They know these things. They know God, the Bible says. But they deny Him in their works, but they have known Him. And they're dangerous. And that's why people can't believe what God's Word says, because they see that kind of stuff. They think, well, it must be all right. They're still praying. They lift up their hands and they worship a little bit. They holler and whoop in a little bit. They rejoice a little bit. They must be all right. Huh? Now, there ain't no fruit, they're dead. They're twice plucked up by the roots. That's it. Proverbs chapter 9. Verse 13 says this. Won't you hear me? A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. And that word clamorous just means noisy. That's all it means. It's noisy. Same thing in back in Timothy. Chattering. Noisy. For she sitteth at the door of her house, on a seat in the high places of the city, to call passengers who go right on their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten secret is pleasant. In other words, deceitfulness is all right. But he knoweth not. Listen to what this said. This is talking about a foolish woman now. But he knoweth not that the dead, oh, twice dead, yeah, the dead are there. The dead, the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Foolish now, foolish woman, clever. Her guests are in the depths. The Bible says a companion of fools will be destroyed. A companion of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 10, verse 1, next verse. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness. You hear that? Is the heaviness. Is the heaviness of his mother. Heaviness. Ecclesiastes 7. The foolishness. See, the devil's a deceiver, boy. He's a master. He is a man. And there's only one thing. There's only one thing that the devil can't outdo. And that's the word of God. I mean, the, the word of God nails that rascal every time. I mean, the word of God is just it's right there. The, the devil cannot outdo the word of the Lord. He can outdo us. He can outdo us, but he cannot outdo God's word. And if we just have enough sense to hear the word of God, the devil won't outdo us. Because God's word, God's word reveals. You know, the Lord, ta ta the Lord taught me that. I mean, I'd be praying, and the Lord would show something. And I'd say, Lord, 
Oh, is that, is that really for real? And God said, sure it is. Open my word and you'll see it right there. I can't talk about situation after situation. I mean, I'd be praying and God would show me and tell me the situation. And then God would say, open my word and I'm going to show you. It's, it's just right there. Just open it. Don't twist it. Don't try and pervert it. Don't try and make anything fit. Just open the word of God. Just read it, Kurt. Just read it and believe exactly what it says. And when I do that, sure enough, it's just right clear what the Holy Spirit, because He will lead you and guide you into all truth. Truth don't lead you to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads you. Truth. That's what it's for. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I'm still, I'm, and I'm going to get back here in a second. I'm talking about bitterness now. Whence comes bitterness? It comes from disillusionment and it comes from foolishness. And I'm going to show you that. And I'm not saying there's not other things, but I'm going to show you them are some of the principal things that are used. And part of the, a major part of that, hope deferred, makes the heart sick. When people hope, when there is no hope, they become sick. In other words, they become wounded. And when you become wounded in your spirit, you know what happens? You open the door. You open the door for bitterness. And it comes in. That's right. You see, if Jesus did not know what was going down when he went to the cross, see, he knew exactly what was going to happen to him. I'm convinced of that. I believe he knew exactly. And so, so when he saw it unfolding, he knew exactly how to react to it. He reacted perfectly. 100% right. Perfectly. Why? See, because he, ha he didn't have no hope. He knew there was no other hope. He knew there was no way to change it. He there knew there was no way to change them that were doing it to him now. Because he knew what they were. He knew what was in all man. And therefore, he knew what to do. I'm telling you, like the juvenile, people still have hope for them. I mean, these people that got 20, 30, 40 convictions, they're reprobate. A lot of them are reprobate. They're, 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 they're totally reprobate. They're 100% completely reprobate. See, and these little social workers still have a little bit of hope, you know. And, you, and what they need to do, they just, they just need to put them away. And they just need to pronounce judgment on them and get them out of the way. That's what needs to be done. That's what needs to be done. I'm telling you, that, that's what needs to be done. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. But they still got hope for them. I pride mine heart, verse 25. Ecclesiastes 7, 25. Now, this is. I'm telling you. I'm talking about bitterness now. Whence, whence does it come? I pride mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. Now, he's going to tell you what the wickedness of folly, of foolishness, and madness is. Next verse, he says, And I find more bitter than death. The woman. What kind of woman? He's talking about foolishness and folly and madness. He's saying, I find more bitter than death a foolish woman. He's telling you the end of the matter of foolishness. He says, I've studied this all out. God has given me divine wisdom like no man on the face of the earth has given, been given. God gave Solomon wisdom. See, that's why people say, well, Proverbs is just the, 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 the wisdom of Solomon. No, it's not. It's the wisdom of God God gave to Solomon. He says, God gave to Solomon wisdom and largeness of heart to where he could receive that wisdom of God. And that's God's wisdom there. That's the final reckoning. That's a sum of what God, how he looks on this thing. He said, I find more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her. But the sinner shall be taken by her. Proverbs chapter 7. You mean to tell me a little silly foolish woman brings bitterness? Yep, more bitter than death. A bit... Bitterness. That's exactly right. I am telling you that without any hesitation. It's amazing, isn't it? The devil is a deceiver. We would think that type of stuff would bring joy and happiness. But a fool brings heaviness. Yes, it does. Whether it be female or male, it's heaviness. It brings bitterness. Yes, it does. Bitterness. Bitterness. Proverbs 7. He says, but a foolish son is bitterness 
to her that bear him. Okay. There's a foolish son is what? Wait, wait, wait a minute. That can't be. No, that's not the truth. Is that the truth? I mean, a foolish son brings bitterness? No. I can't buy that. I can't believe that. That's what the word of God says. A foolish son is bitter. Proverbs chapter 5. That's what it says now. It's in there. I don't, I don't have the right description on it, but it's in there. I have that Proverbs chapter 5. Verse 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil. Smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood. Sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou should ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know. Movable. What do you mean? One minute it's a little bit flattering. The Lord taught me about flattery. Boy. I wouldn't trust a flatterer for nothing. <laughs> I won't do it. I've, I've, the flatterers is one to stab you in the back. And then they flatter you with their lips, but their heart is far. They, they flatter. Amen. I would, but one minute there's a flattering, oh, what wonderful or great uh, this or that or whatever it may be, flattering and lightness. Then the next minute, man, there's a harshness, accusation, kind of like an up and down, yo-yo. Boom. Ways are movable. You can't know. But it's what is it? It's more bitter than death. More bitter than death. I'm telling you. Proverbs 26. Bitter than death. She's cast down many wounded. Wounded now. And many strong men have been slain by her. But many wounded now. Wounded. 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 What do you mean wounded? Wounded in the spirit. A man's spirit will sustain his infirmity. But a wounded spirit. Who can bear it? No man can bear a wounded spirit. When the spirit becomes wounded, it is unbearable. And it begins to be filled with a bitterness. Yes, it does. I'm going to get into that a little bit. Proverbs 26, verse 6 and 8. Proverbs 26, verse 6. He that sendeth a mount, a message, by the hand of a fool, cutteth off the feet. You want to cut your feet off? Huh? You trying to stand firmly? And you want to cut your feet off? Cut your feet off. Just tells you how to do it. Send a message by the hand of a fool. And you'll drink to yourself damage. Verse 8, as he that bindeth a stone in a sling, so is he that giveth honor to a fool. And then rod. Fool. Honor fool. Mock God. Honor fool. Mock God. That's what you do. You mock God when you honor a fool. You mock God when you honor fools. That's what, and and the, that's what the world's doing today. You know who's getting honored, don't you? You know who's getting into the presidencies and the congresses and the kings. It's fools, man. They're fools. And they, they are fools. I mean, our president today has sat in camp meetings where the power of God was powerful. He knows about God. Amen. There's some people down in Arkansas. Amen. Spirit-filled, Pentecostal people. Amen. Camp meetings. And I know some of them camp meetings, they, you get back there in them, them parts, man, and this was years ago, the power of God was there. Conviction was there. Understanding was there. Knowledge was there. He sat in them, boy. He knows about it. But he just let it go. They, they know God. They know about God. Amen. And he says, verse number 18 through 19. Oh, verse 11. That's a dog returneth to his body. So a fool returneth to his folly. The same with this nation. Nobody's going to change this nation. This nation is a nation of fools. Nobody is going to change it. Period. Why? Because it's that reprobate spirit. This nation is just going to continue to return to its vomit. Over and over and over. Until finally God cuts its neck. 
That's what's going to happen. Verse 18 and 19 says this. It's just, it's just there. As a madman who casted firebrands, arrows, and death. Nobody hardly believes this scripture. There's hardly a person on the face of the earth who will actually believe this scripture like it's written. As a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death. So is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, Hey, man, I'm just kidding you. I'm not, I'm not in sport. I'm just joking. Now, I want to go to Psalm 6. Now, it, it, it is, uh, is death bitter? I find more bitter than death. Amen. Cruel is the grave. Death is bitter now. It's bitter. Oh, we know Jesus took away the sting for us, but death is a bitter thing. Death separates loved ones. Death is bitter, boy. If you watch the wicked die, it's bitter, boy. It's a bitter thing. And yet it says, this is what this is. He's casting death, which is what? Bitterness. Arrows. Psalm 64. Arrows. 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 Arrows now. Arrows. Arrows. Psalm 64. I'll start with verse 1. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity, who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows. Even bitter words. That they may, now listen to what he says though now. They're not going to shoot bitter words at you that you think are bitter. He says, that they may shoot in secret at the purpose. Now that, that arrow that's flying on you is not going to be labeled bitterness. It's not going to have a little ribbon attached on with a batter string behind it. Saying, this is bitterness being shot at you. Now, it's in secret. That arrow is not going to have no label on it. Even if it had any label, it would probably have a label like joke. Yes. Or flattery, or some other label. That's what's going to be labeled. Come in. Even secret. Suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying snares privately. They say, Who shall see, see them? And firebrands? Firebrands. Does James chapter 3 say something about firebrands? That the tongue is a what a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. That it defileth, does what? The whole body. Amen. If any man fail of the grace of God, lest many be do, lest any root of bitterness spring up, lest many be what? Defiled. Where's it coming? Coming right out of that tongue. And then he goes on down to talk about it is set on fire of hell. And then he goes down a little further and talks about bitterness. That's where it comes from now. Exactly where it comes from. Come from the tongue. It's a fire. Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs 18. Hope deferred. This, these people are going to get bitter when they see what God does to this nation. See, because they got a false hope. And they're going to be sick. And they're going to get bitter. We've never seen bitterness yet. And people get bitter. Can't change somebody, get bitter. Don't get bitter. Just believe the word of God. God's word is true. If God says somebody's unchangeable, then you can't change it. God says, it's just like this, the world's unchangeable, you're not going to change it. And if you keep trying and you keep failing, you're going to get bitter. What you need to do is just lift up your hands and say, Lord, you're doing right. You're doing all right. I'm just going to rejoice in you. I'm going to commit myself to you. I believe the end of all flesh is at hand, and you're going to do right. And I'm just going to be sober, and I'm going to go on my way. Proverbs chapter 18. That's all you can do. A wounded spirit. Verse 14 says this. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear it. Proverbs 17, 22 says this. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. And Proverbs 12, 14 says this. Notice that it dries. A, what? a broken spirit does what? It dries your bones. All right. Then Proverbs 12, 14 says this. Or 12, 14. Yeah, there we go. Wait, no, that's not it. I'm going to leave it. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. 
But she that maketh ashamed, verse 4, 12, 4. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as what? Rottenness in his bone. What is he talking about? I mean, how in the world could a woman make a man ashamed? I'll tell you how they do it. They talk. Hey, that's what the Apostle Paul says. That shames God in the church, women. Amen. That's what shames God. That's what shames. That's what shames even God. Huh? Because God is God's house. What shames him is, is a woman. Oh, yeah, yeah. A woman in the church. It's a shame for a woman to talk to the church. It's not a shame for a woman to talk. Amen. But for a woman to be foolish now, to be clamorous, to be talkative, to be chattering, yeah, that's a shame. And that's a rottenness, man. And, and if you ever heard the word for bitterness, it's rottenness. Rottenness is like a bitter. It begins to eat. It's a putrefying type of thing. You know what I'm saying? It's like a bitterness. Amen. Somebody say, well, well, a person shouldn't let their spirit get... Yeah, they shouldn't. The Bible says uh, their offenses are coming. Amen. But the Bible says, woe unto the man. Woe unto that person by whom the offense comes. Yeah, so one of these little children might get offended. One of God's people might get offended. Right? And they're not correct to be offended, but woe unto the person that causes them to be offended. That's where the woe is. Woe to the person that causes them to be offended. I'm going back to Hebrews 12. I'm telling you, the dangerous spirit. The Bible, you know, the Bible talks about the head, man being the head. Woman uncovered, it's a shame. You don't know, that's talking about submission. Hey Amen. You're not submissive to your husband, man, you shame him. It's like rottenness in his bones. Of course, he can stop it. But, he can't stop you. God won't stop you, though. Hey Amen. Might be the day of judgment. God won't stop you. He, knows, he ain't gonna let nothing in his kingdom. That offense. See, that's offense. That's an offense. You, you, you shame your husband. You're an offense. You see, Jesus, Peter, he, he, Jesus was, you know, Jesus was very careful. When he about ready to go to the cross, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be crucified. And they're going to lift me up. Peter said, hey, Lord, that'll never be such. Jesus, this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, get, get behind me, Satan. He didn't say, give me how to Peter. He says, thou art an offense unto me. Peter was never an offense unto Jesus. Peter was never an offense to Jesus. Satan was an offense. Satan was an offense. He said, give me an offense unto me. He's talking about Satan. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense. Satan, you are an offense unto me. He wasn't offended at Judah, at, at, at uh, Peter. Peter didn't offend him. Why? Because just, just like them, when, when Peter denied him three times, and the, and the Bible says, Jesus looked on him. And I, I don't think Jesus said, I told you so, Peter. I, I don't believe it was that. I, I believe there was no hostility, no bitterness. I believe Jesus was just greedy. I believe he looked at Peter. He just kind of closed his eyes. Probably wept a tear. I believe his heart was greedy. I really do. I, I believe he was greedy. Why? Well, see, because Peter was offense. And what I'm trying to tell you, nobody offense. Perfect peace are they which love his law, and nothing shall offend them. There's nobody that ought to offend us. We have to be careful that nobody offends us. You know, if, if, if you see evil, it, it's coming from the devil one way or another. I mean, he is behind all of it, every bit. You know, this wisdom that is earthly, that, that I was talking about in James, it says it is earthly, it is sensual, and it's what? devilish. So that's what you've got to understand. See, and that's the key to overcoming it. It is devilish. It is devilish. Amen. And that's, see, that's where Jesus understood about Peter. That was the devil working through him. He wasn't hostile at Peter. Amen. He was hostile at Satan. Amen. He set his guns on Satan. Hebrews chapter 12. But thankful. You see, our spirit can get worn down. It can. We can get weary. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 and 3 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Now, who was he enduring when he was on the cross? I'm telling you, with the scribes and the Pharisees 
and, and the mockers and the scorners and the fool. He had to endure that contradiction against himself. And what does it say? Then he says, against it, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. In other words, don't let it tire you out. In other words, you better set your mind that until the day you breathe the last breath, you're going to have to fight against these spirits. You cannot go tired. You're going to have to gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. You're going to have to watch. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to see God. You're going to have to open the Word of God. You're going to have to hold fast. There is no reprieve in this warfare until the day you suck in your last breath and breathe it out. And then he said, neither be faint. He said, don't relax. Do not relax. Do not relax. One iota. That's what it means. Go, you can set it out any way you want. It means don't be faint. Don't relax. Don't just sit back and say, I think I'll just relax for a while, get my breath. No, you ain't got no time to get your breath. You ain't got no time to get your breath. You better keep your breath. Hold your breath. Amen. This thing's getting more and more. First, I'm going to go on down, verse 13 through 15 now. Start with verse 12. Wherefore, ye ain't resisted yet unto blood, neither have I. We got no excuse. Wherefore, lift up the cans which came down, and the feeble knees, and make strength pass for your people, lest that which is lame be what? Turned out of the way. In other words, in other words, if you become weary and you have feeble knees, and you just get tired of all this, you're going to lose this race. You're going to lose out. You are finally going to fail of God's grace. And that bitterness is going to get you. It's going to touch you. It's going to fill you. First Thessalonians chapter 5. It's got a couple of scriptures. I won't stop. Verse 15 through 19. Thankfulness. God doing all things right. He is everything. We just thank him. That's what you got to do. First Daniel chapter 5, verse 15. See that none render evil for evil to any man, but ever follow. I like that. But ever follow. Huh? But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. You know how you quench the Spirit? By not giving thanks. You stop giving thanks. When you stop thanking God, that bitterness starts coming in. And remember that, that that's the first step to foolishness. Neither were thankful but became what? Vain, fool. And their foolish heart was what? Darkened. See, you know what that does? That quenches. You know, the Bible talks about doing despite unto the spirit of grace. That's quenching the spirit. And that's when you become unthankful, you begin to get vain. You begin to get foolish. And what you're doing at that time is you're quenching the spirit of God, and you are beginning to fail. God's grace. Beginning to fail. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, beginning to fail the grace of God, beginning to do it. See, we like to control everything, don't we? Sure we do. Don't you like to try and control everything? That's our problem. We should let God control it all and just do what he wants us to do and flow with him. Amen. So if we want to control things, that gets us in problem. Be- because you see, God has purposely put some uncontrollable elements. See, the elements are reserved. They're reserved now. And God has put some uncontrollable elements that you're never going to control. God has made it fit that you will not control them. And when you try, you're just going to get yourself in trouble. You're going to get yourself you're going to get yourself discouraged. You're going to get yourself disillusioned. And finally, you're going to become bitter. You just got to rejoice in everything. Ephesians chapter 4 says this. Verse 30 through 32 says this. And grieve 
Now, verse tw- I'm sorry, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. How do you grieve it? He tells you right after. He says, if you permit these things, you grieve God's Spirit. Therefore, he says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speak, be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. If my brother, brother trespass against me seventy times seven, Forgive them. But don't be stupid. I hope you realize something wrong. Be harmless as a dove, filled with love, forgiving, kind. But be wise as a servant. Understand what's working. The situation. Because if you don't, you're going to be overcome. Be wise as a serpent now. And if our wisdom through God's word better match the wisdom of our adversary, but then we always must understand that we have to be harmless harmless as a dove so be thankful and everything just thank God amen there's times you can do things there's times you can't do nothing I mean I hear that all the time I mean it's all over the world there's places you can't do nothing period just like Jesus could do nothing in a place they would not permit him so I want to say you can fail God's grace. Bitterness actually comes through disillusion. It actually comes through foolishness. One of the reasons that foolishness brings bitterness is because people think they can change it, and they can't. And, they be, and, and, and actually they become disillusioned.